Hello and welcome to 10,000 Books and More. I am your host Lauren and today I am interviewing Lois Curran. Before we get started, I would like to um, let you know that I do have bronchitis at the moment, so there will be times when I will be coughing or clearing my throat, and I apologize for that. There are also times you may hear the cats in the background. I will edit them out if possible. So again, today my, my guest is Miss Lois Curran, and she is the author of Deliberate Malice, which is the book of the month for the Homegrown Books Book of the Month Club. Miss Curran, thank you, and welcome to my show. Well, thank you for having me. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself. All righty. Uh, I was born in Arkansas, but I spent my childhood in Salem, Oregon. Uh, we moved to Missouri when I was almost 16, and I've been here ever since. I'm a registered nurse, and I worked 44 plus years at our local health department until I retired a couple of years ago. Oh, wow. So um, at what point did you decide to become an author, and, and what was your path to the publication? Okay, uh, I've always wanted to be a writer. Uh, writing has always been my passion, but I just never made the time for it. However, I talked about it for years. My sons heard all their childhood years how I was going to write my novel someday. So about nine to ten years ago, my sons are all grown by now, my son Lon gave me some books on how to write a novel. He had a little card in there, and it said, Mom, it's time to write your book. So I read those books and I thought, if I'm going to do this, I need to just do it. So I sat down at the computer and I started writing my first novel. Oh, how fun. It's nice that you have that encouragement from your family. Yes, yes, they're very encouraging and I appreciate that so much. Now, um, have you been able to incorporate your previous experiences from your job or your education into your writing? Oh, I sure have. This Deliberate Malice is a medical suspense thriller that uh, is based around uh, the main character is uh, the director of nursing at the local health department, and that's exactly what I was. So, I yes, I've incorporated that into the book. Okay, and is she based on you? or? <laughs> Loosely. Loosely. I, I tell you what, yeah, she, she's loosely based on me in the sense that... Uh, she knows how to do public health. She knows how to do investigations of communicable diseases and stuff. So, yes, loosely, it's me. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's that's wonderful. I really did enjoy your book. And as I noted in my review, um, I couldn't find anything about your book I didn't like. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank it you was, very much. It was, I appreciate that. It was, I, I rarely do five stars. Um because as, as a writer myself, I'm very critical of things that I read. And I really enjoyed your writing style, as well as all the information. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, now I'm going to ask you, can you tell us a little bit about your book and um, the world that you've created? I sure can. Uh, <laughs> Uh, like I said, Deliberate Malice, it's a, a medical suspense thriller based on a medical mishap that could actually happen. And I used real world details to create to create a credible story that could happen when a county is suddenly caught up in a polio crisis. The local health department and the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, they dive into an investigation trying to find out why an eradicated disease has shown its ugly head in just one county in one one state in the United States. Yeah, and I'll tell you that that was uh, having a, a slight medical background. Of course, I come in on the admin side. Um, that was that was actually a very terrifying thought. <laughs> I, I I've got a I I have a friend whose wife was much older and she had survived polio, so I kind of had a personal uh, experience with that. Uh, yes, and a little background in the uh, one of the uh, all three books that my son had given me on how to write a novel. It gave uh, information on your first novel. You should write about something that you know about, mm -hmm. and also think what if. 
And actually, Deliberate Malice was my first novel. It's just been laying on the shelf, me working at, on it all these years. But that's what I did. I thought, what do I know about? I know about public health. I've done this for years. And then I thought, what if? And that polio thought came to me. And that's, that's how it got started. Well, I found your book fascinating. Um, now, tell us about your main characters and what makes them tick. Okay. My main character is Lacey Bookman, and she's the director of nursing at the local health department. And her forte is the communicable disease investigations. She's conscientious and a detail-oriented supervisor, and she gets a lot of satisfaction from completing her tasks well. She wants everything to be done, and she wants it to be done in, in order and get it taken care of. And she's conducted many uh, such investigations during her tenure as the director of nursing, but the polio cases have her in a dilemma. She knows that this disease should not be occurring, especially in well-immunized children. And uh, Jake Bookman, Jacob, he's Lacey's husband, and he's a strong secondary character. He's going through a midlife crisis, and he gets involved with a much younger subordinate in his office. He loves his wife, Lacey, but he thinks he can have a little fun on the side flirting with Kimberly. But his so-called innocent behavior leads him down a road, a path that he soon regrets. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, do you identify much with your main character, or do you feel she's more your opposite? I, she's not my opposite. She's the, I, can, I, I feel that she is acting in this scenario like I would have acted, like where is this coming from? I can't believe it, because during my time, Working at the health department, I went through H1N1. I went through the measles outbreak. And when something like that hits, you're like, how can this be happening here? And I mean, it's a nightmare getting through it. So I, I can identify, she can identify, and I can identify with what's going on there. Right, right. And uh, which character was the most challenging for you to write? Okay, my, my most difficult character to write was the antagonist in my story, because even though I am this person and it's she is not based on anybody else that I know of but it was difficult for me to believe somebody could be sick enough to act the way she did so that, that was hard <laughs> for me to write because I you know I, I, I would go back and like I don't I haven't made it quite bad enough yet so I'd make it a little worse and a little worse I actually found her very interesting I liked the way you portrayed her without giving her away where we get little little tidbits inside her head so we kind of start to see what makes her tick and i i came from also mental health administrative background and i kept thinking oh my god she needs to go see dr finzo <laughs> and uh, yeah he was our director of our clinic he was an amazing doctor <laughs> but uh, so what chapter scene was your favorite you know, I loved writing the final two chapters because I loved how I could tie everything together and, and make everything come to light, and the details were tied up neatly in a nice little bow. Oh, that was good. Yeah. Yeah. And now, now, what one was the hardest for you to write? Okay. <clears throat> My diff most difficult scene to write was the one about the injured puppy. I wanted oh. to handle that in a way that wouldn't offend <clears throat> pet lovers. It was an important part of the story, uh, showing that the antagonist did have a good side, and uh, I don't want to go into too many details about right. that and spoil it for people, but that was the hardest one, you know, with the injured puppy. Right, right. And I, I can completely understand that, too. Uh, that was a hard hard to read and i have to admit there there's a lot of tension in your book and i loved it but there were times i had to put down and walk away just for a little bit um just to kind of diffuse the tension for me because it was it was just i think part of it being my own background um that that i found that tension and suspense just almost nail biting for me Okay, and, and that was what I was trying to get with my suspense thriller, you know, yes. so I appreciate it, that I got that kind of feedback on it. Yeah, so. and, I, and, I, and I have to say, I love your twist ending. I, I love the way you reveal who did it and how, and I love 
how you didn't just jump in and say, this is my protagonist. We, instead, we, we just, we get in her thoughts in, in those separate chapters. And um, it, it was, it, it felt like a really good suspense mixed with a whodunit. Because okay. you're you're reaching for, and, and and it killed me not to go to the end of the book and see okay who is this because I spent the whole book thinking it's this person no it's this person and I have to say I never did guess I I never guessed the right person okay that was good too because I'm like okay I don't want to make it obvious but I don't want to yeah. make it so unbelievable what it is that yeah you're gonna think, oh, but on, then now. once once you get the reveal it all made sense. Uh -huh. So I, I really think you did very well. This did not feel like a first time book. This felt like you were a very experienced author when I was reading it. Well, let me tell you, it was my first book. I, I, that was the one I first completed. And I thought that no word in ever had been written as good as that book. But then I put it down and I got into the re uh, writers groups and things and I learned a lot. And that's when I did my romance. After mm -hmm. I did my romances, I had learned so much. I went back to this novel and I'm like, this needs a lot of work because I've learned so much and I literally redid it. <laughs> now, did you have to do any research for your book? Oh, yes, I did a lot of research. I pretty well knew because of my uh, years at the health department what the uh, involvement of the CDC would be, but I wanted it to be right. I didn't want it, you know, me to put something in there that wasn't true. So I contacted the uh, CDC immunization department, and I told them who I was, and I worked at the health department as a nurse, but I also was an author, and I had questions. The man was so good to talk <coughs> to me. And uh, I was asking exactly what would happen on their end if a case of polio popped up in the local county. And he said, uh, I was spot on that the health department, would, they would be the leaders of trying to do it. The CDC would be the backup. But I, I just had to make sure that I was on the right track there. Then I also did research on what countries that polio remained endemic in so mm -hmm. I could find out where this came from. Well, I, I feel like everything just felt so believable and so realistic. And I, that's probably why I had to put it down a few times because I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Because um, it did feel like it, it really could happen. And your characters felt so real. They weren't perfect. They weren't cookie cutter. Um, it didn't feel like you had any characters that were in the book that didn't need to be there. <clears throat> Even your side characters, every character I felt that you introduced had a purpose of some sort. Okay, well, that's good. I didn't yeah. want you. <laughs> yeah, you, I, yeah, so it's like you didn't have the extraneous characters that are like, that serve no purpose other than filler. So it didn't feel like you had just filler characters or two-dimensional. So I appreciate that as a reader. Okay. And what what is your favorite line from your book? Uh... Actually, I, I'm going to pass on that because if I would, uh, it might, would it might give on, a spoiler. <laughs> yeah, it would be a spoiler. It really okay. No, no problem. Um, so did your initial vision of your book change as you were writing it or? Um, yes, it did. It, it uh, definitely changed all of my books that I've written. I start out with my idea and as I write, uh, I think of different scenarios that could happen that would make it better that would make it more realistic and so yes it changes as i go along okay and and is that the same with your characters when you develop them you know who they are or do they start developing and going off in different directions uh yes uh, i uh, I know who I want my character to be, and I start writing about that character. But as I write about that character, it is really weird because then when that character becomes so real to me that I feel like I know that character on a personal level, then it does change because I'm like, she wouldn't do that or he wouldn't do that. So, yes, I know who I want them to be, but they then they do change as we write. Okay. That's very, that's very good. No, a lot of, I've, I've noticed that a lot of writers have that same scenario where it's like you, you think you know your character and then when you get into their head or 
sometimes they'll be like, oh, no, 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 that's not what I would do. I would do this. And your characters sometimes yeah. take off on their own. <clears throat> Yeah. So, like I said, I have an idea of who I want them to be, but the more I write about them, the more I let them uh, like develop into their own entity. Right. And um, now, how does this book compare with the other ones you've written? Well, it's completely different because the other ones, uh, the other was a, a romance trilogy. Uh, so it's completely different. It, you know, this is the suspense thriller. This mm -hmm. is where my heart lies. I really like the suspense thrillers. And uh, so my, my first three books that was published was the, the romance. And I really had fun writing them. And you know what uh, made me sound strange to people? It, it was about three sisters trying to find second chances in love. Each each book was about a different sister. I miss those sisters. Now that the <laughs> books are done and completed, I miss them. I, I, I created them. I made mm -hmm. them up, and I miss them. You know, um, as, as a writer myself, um, I can relate to that. I have a character I created probably 14 years old when I was playing Dungeons and Dragons back in the day. And she has evolved and evolved and evolved. And to this day, I still write about her because I can't, I just can't let her go. She's so fun. I know. And it's funny <laughs> how they can just become part of you because it, it's, you just, you make them up. They, they're your creation. Yeah. They're, it's like, they're, they're like one of your children. <laughs> yes, I know it. You gave birth to them. So now I know that your sons have encouraged your writing, but what does the rest of your family think about you being a writer? Oh, they love it, and they're saying, "Is why didn't you do this a lot sooner?" You know, they're every everybody in my family is a hundred percent behind me and encourage me, and it, it it's wonderful. I they think it's great. That's wonderful. And do you have other other writers in your family? I have a nephew that wrote uh, he wrote a devotional book oh probably about six or seven years ago and I wished he would continue because it was a very good book but that's the only one that I know of that's in my family that's writing okay and and do you have any unique or quirky writing habits you know what I honestly don't think that I do but maybe they just don't seem quirky to me you know? <laughs> I can relate. And um, who are your who are your target readers? Okay, um, my target readers for the de deliberate malice it would be the medical community as well as all ages who are into suspense thrillers. I don't think that you'd have to be in the medical community if you wanted just to read a good suspense thriller. But I think if you in the medical community community you would really get into it too. So I think. It, it's a wide spectrum that would be my yeah. target. Okay. Yeah, and, and the thing I liked about your medical thriller is even though you had an opportunity to throw tons and tons and tons of medical jargon that the average person wouldn't understand, you didn't do that. And you, you made your reader, reader uh, just wider the 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 people that could read this and understand it i liked that you used layman's terms so i understood what was going on even though i know some of that medical jargon i don't know nearly as much as a nurse would know <laughs> and and it was it was refreshing not to be bombarded with medical jargon and, and I tried to tell myself that when I was writing, I'm like, everybody that reads this is not going to be a nurse, so don't, you know, don't mm -hmm. get to medical terms with them. Tell them what you're talking about. Now, would you say being writer, being a writer, is it a gift or a curse for you? Okay, you know what? I feel it's a gift. It entails a lot of hard work and a lot of time but you know what it doesn't feel like work to me because i love every minute of it and then the satisfaction that i experience when my stories start to make sense and it all pulls together it makes it all worthwhile i just so to me mm -hmm. I, I oh it's a total gift and what was the most surprising thing you've learned since you started writing the most surprising thing I learned when I started writing is how real my characters become to me. I mean, it's it's like I start out writing about a character, but then it's like they're part of me. They're my family. I know them. They know me. And that, that's what surprised me is how involved I get with my characters. 
that's very interesting um yeah and and again i can relate to that with like i said my character i created at 14 i just i have a hard time letting her go and um i i never would have thought that i could be so attached to somebody who isn't even real but just a figment of imagination but it happens <laughs> it happens a lot um so have you received any memorable feedback or responses from your readers that particularly touched or surprised you? Uh, yes, I, uh, I have been contacted by several people that are in the medical field uh, that I wasn't even aware that was going to be reading my book. And they contacted me to tell me how real it felt to them when they were reading it. And that, that really made me feel good. That's nice. That's yeah. And, and, it, it kind of validates yourself as a writer, especially when you have people in medical field saying, oh, my gosh, this was so good and so real. Yeah. And I mean, you it's your baby when you put it out there. And it's kind of nice having that validation and and even just having a, a little small fan base. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. It, it makes you think, oh, because, you know, you wonder the whole time is, are people going to like this book as much as I like mm -hmm. it, you know? <laughs> And um, what do you enjoy most about writing? Oh, I just, I think the thing that I enjoy most about it is creating the scenario and then putting the characters into it. That's, it's just like I'll have, I, I have an idea and I will play with that idea back and forth and I'm like, oh, that's not going to work. This isn't going to work. And I just keep playing with it and tossing it around till bam, I'm, I have it. And then when I know that I've got it, I know there's going to be a lot of changes down the road, but I know where I'm going with it. That's good. And um, what's been the most challenging part of writing for you? Oh, let me see. Well, I think been the most oh, the most challenging part of writing is to just get myself into my office, set my behind down in the book and <laughs> in the chair and write, whether I feel like it or not. You know, you can't just say, "Oh, I need to get in there. I need to do this." No, don't don't say that. Go do it. That's that's the hardest part. And once you sit down, even if you think, "I don't I don't know what I'm going to say today or or what I'm going to how I'm going to go with this today." Once you start writing, things will come to you. Yeah, and and I agree. Um, I've I've done, you know, where you stare at a blank page, and it can be intimidating. Sometimes you just need to close your eyes, take a deep breath, and open up a vein and put it out on the paper. <laughs> I know it, and you know what I found? I I have a lot of writer friends that tell me they hate to edit their work, but here's how I am. Uh, once I can get some words on the page, something to look at, I can go back and make it better. Once I get something going, then I, I love going back and making that story better. That's that, it, and that's good. Now, are are do you? I have to ask if you have my bad habit. When I start writing, I keep going back and editing before I finish the book. Are you as bad as me, or do you actually write out your draft and then go edit? <laughs> no, I, I'm like you in the sense that I go back and edit. Except our writing group has a, what we call this month it's called Jano, and our goal is to write fifty thousand words in the month of Jano of uh, January. <laughs> and so I'm not going back and editing on this i'm just writing but any other time when i'm not into doing something like this i do i'll write a chapter or two and then i go back and i change it and then i go back but this i'm just going to write the words and then when i'm done at the end of january then i'll work on it that's actually the way they tell us to do it but i'm like i can't leave it alone i have to go back and pick at it <laughs> I know, and it, it's amazing because once you go back and pick at it, you can. You're like, well, look how much better that looks. <laughs> yes, yes, and it, it. My my biggest thing is just when to stop editing. That's probably why I haven't finished many, is because I can't stop editing. I need to stop editing and finish the book. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's like I don't think you just have to make yourself finally stop. Yeah. Because it's yeah. I know. I, I, I'm, I find myself want to edit uh, it to death. So, so how do you celebrate when you finish a book? Do you know what? I do not really celebrate. I just am so excited and glad that it's done, and I just start focusing on what I want to do next. 
there's that's a good way to do it uh -huh. now how many books total have you written and published i have four books out there that's published mm -hmm. and i have short stories and two anthologies that's published oh nice uh, yeah i've got my three uh the trilogy romance and then i've got uh deliberate malice mm -hmm. so that's four that's out there published i'm excited about that that's very exciting and are you are you working on anything new right now or anything that you're still have that's unpublished yes i am working i started another medical suspense thriller this is the one that i'm working on in uh in our little group for jano it's a medical suspense thriller and i hope to have it finished and published by mid-year oh how wonderful i look yeah. forward to, to reading it because i i really enjoyed this first one Okay, so that's, that's what I'm working on. <laughs> there you go. So, um, what's the most valuable piece of advice you've ever been given about writing? The most valuable advice I've been given about writing is just sit down and do it. Because when I wrote my first book, well, not, okay, not Deliberate Malice, but when I got my first romance book published, I thought, I don't have this in me. I don't have another idea. I don't know what to do. I don't know what, I don't think I can do it. And all of the ones in my writer's group encouraged me and said, everybody thinks that. You just have to sit down and write. Just sit down and write. Don't, don't check it. <laughs> think about it just do it so that was my that was my thing you've got to just write that's all you've got to do to get started and do you have any other arts or or hobbies that you do besides writing and do they ever tie into your writing uh not maybe not really i scrapbook i'm, I'm really good at scrapbooking <laughs> and i'm into amateur photography i do the pictures all the time but <laughs> I, I don't know that that ties into my writing. I knit and crochet, but I haven't done that for years. So okay. basically writing is my only really artistic thing I do, <laughs> I guess. Well, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, can you tell us what your writing space looks like? Uh, I have my third bedroom. Uh, I just uh, had turned it into an office. It has a desk in there, and I've got a combination uh, a cork board and erase board that's up on the wall. And I write down who my characters are and their ages and stuff because, believe it or not, you will forget down through the chapters how some of the things you've done. And the it's got a little. Uh, it looks just like a little sofa in there, but then it folds out into a single bed in case I need it for company. So that's, that's where I work. And if I get tired of sitting at my desk, I just bring my laptop into my uh, recliner for a while. Oh, there you go. So do you have uh, like a window above your desk that gives you a great view or anything yes. that in there inspires you? Yes, I my uh, desk is right in front uh, of the uh, street that goes in front of my house and I can look right out and just see people going back and forth. There's a lot of people that walk up and down and stuff and I can look out and gaze at them while I'm trying to think of something else. So yeah, it's it's a nice space. That's good. And how many hours a day would you say you write? Oh gosh, it depends. With this channel that I've been doing in January, I'm, I'm probably writing uh six or seven hours and if i'm not doing that it's usually two to four uh, it, it just depends on you know some, some days like if i'm going back to edit i might spend the whole day with just a, a little coffee break and a lunch break in between so okay. It, it just depends. okay and so do you you so i would assume when you're doing the long haul you do most of the day um, when you're when you're not doing a writing marathon, what time of day do you usually do most of your writing? I'm mornings. I'm a morning person. I like to get up and uh, uh, get a cup of coffee and watch the news and then go right in and start writing. That's when I think best. And I can write in the afternoon and evening, but morning is when uh, that's when my brain works the best. Oh, yep. Uh, yeah, and I'm the opposite. I'm the night owl. I can be up till... I, when I when I was able to do a lot of writing, I would probably be up to like three, four, five in the morning, oh, okay. and then try to stagger yeah. into work. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've always been a, an odd night owl, so.
Okay. So, um, just curious, how do you come up with your character names? I tell you, this the new book that I am uh, that I had just started. I went into my uh, Facebook page of my friends, and I just went down through there and picked some names that I liked. That's cool. I did. Yeah. That's interesting. I've I've yeah. never thought about doing it that way. Yeah. I'm I'm bad. I actually have a spreadsheet full of names, like from all over the world, from fantasy, from everywhere. And I have this weird habit of walking graveyards to pick names, oh, um, okay. reading headstones. And I, I also read the phone book <laughs> and movie credits because I find oh, okay. some really interesting. I like odd names and odd words and things like that. So. Right. Yes, that, that gives me ideas because I know the more books I write, I'm going to run out of names. You know? Right. <laughs> now, um, you just right now you're just writing in the two genres of romance and um, the, the suspense thrillers. Have you thought of writing in any other genres? No, I really have not. I, I really have not. And like I said, the suspense thriller is where my heart lies, but I'm not going to rule out writing more romance, you know, because I, I had fun doing that, too. Yeah, and that is, from what I understand, it's like the most popular genre in the world, so. I know, it, it is. That's what everybody yeah. keeps telling me, yes. And me personally, I'm not really fond of romance. And you so, know what's funny? But I also oh, grew up with four brothers, so I'm not the girliest of girls. <laughs> But I, I can read a well done one. <laughs> I don't read romance, and this is what surprised me that I wrote romance. And my romance, I had a little different twist to it than most of them. You know, mm -hmm. when I wanted to put some real life scenario things in it. But uh, yeah, because I, I don't, I am not a romance reader. I can write it though, but I can read it. <laughs> yeah, I think I would probably fall in that same category. Um, I just. To me, it's a bit formulaic in the tropes and all that. And I'm not saying that people haven't done unique twists on it. It's just, I I grew up with four, three of my four brothers. And I'm used to, like, playing football and baseball in the street, jumping bikes, playing with Hot Wheels cars, running Barbie over with Tonka trucks. <laughs> I, was, I was not a very very feminine child. I was a delicate child because I was so tiny, but I was not a girly girl, and I'm still at my age of almost 54, I'm still not very girly. Okay. So, yeah, I was just like, I just, I some of, some of the stuff in romance novels, I just I just don't understand, and I, probably because of having brothers. <laughs> now, um, have you ever written anything that shocked you? Uh... Yes, I, I I think I have. I think it shocked me when uh, I wrote about uh, Jake and his little antics that he got into. I was shocked that I could make effects like that. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I'm like, because that's not who I am. But right. I, I, and I know this is odd when I'm doing my point of view characters. It's easier for me to write in the male point of view, and I think that's because I can make them do what I want them to do. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's 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 one thing I used to. It's a terrible joke, and it's very disrespectful. But when I was a kid, I used to explain to my friends, "I'm a god when I write. I'm not the god. I am a god, I'm and a I god. can." <laughs> I can create and destroy an entire world in a day, all with the power of a pen. <laughs> or, in this case now, with computer, because I no longer handwrite everything out. Right. Now, um, have you won any awards for your writing? Uh, yes, I've, uh, I've won a couple of awards over, um, awards over the years, uh, well, a couple of contests. That I entered and I won and I got the certificate and some money for winning. So yes, I have. Oh, that's nice. Money's always good. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of puts food on the table, keeps the lights on, and sometimes you can go treat yourself. <laughs> oh yes, and that's always tough uh, to do. Now I noticed in your your book one thing I really identified with Lacey is her sweet tooth and her thing for coffee. Uh huh. Is that something you also share with her? I share the coffee and not necessarily the sweet tooth, 
but just the food. I have to really watch myself, or I could weigh 800 pounds. You know what I mean? I, <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, I kind of wrote that into that because I, I can identify with that. I really enjoyed that part of her because it made her feel so human, and I was like, you know... I have that love-hate relationship with food, too, because um, having um, the nerve condition that I have, occasionally I, go, I get put on steroids, and they make me feel like I'm starving to death, which I hate, and I it never fails that I gain weight every time they put me on, on like, prednisone or something, and I was, like, going, oh, I can so relate to her. <laughs> Especially the sweet tooth, because I, I, I must have inherited from my dad, but I, I make jokes that you can't bribe me with money or, or material objects, but I can be bribed with chocolate. Oh, yeah. And I love sweets, but I also love, I also love salty, cheesy stuff just as well. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah, dairy is one of my downfalls. I, I've, I've learned I have to lay off the dairy, yeah. especially the cheese and the milk, because... Oh. I'm I'm the odd one where most people like they have a rough day they might come home and have a a, a glass of wine or a beer or whatever. No, nope, I want a tall glass of milk. <laughs> I want milk and cookies. <laughs> so I'm I'm kind of the weird one in that one. So um, what is the most peculiar object on your desk? You know what. I, uh, when I saw that question, I went in there and looked at my desk, mm -hmm. and I thought, you know, nothing looks odd or peculiar to me. Maybe, maybe it is. I do have a hole punch, and I'm like, I wonder why I have that hole punch in there. You know, so that, that was the only thing that I questioned, like, what is that doing there, you know? <laughs> Probably better than me. I have cats on my desk, and you don't get any odder or more peculiar than a cat. <laughs> So, um, do you have a favorite word? Uh, do I have a favorite word? I, yes, I do. My favorite word is succeed, and that's because I consider, I consider every finished product that I do is a success for me. That's a good way. That's a good way of looking at it, because it is, because... Writing is not an easy thing to do. I mean, it is and it isn't because it's not hard to put words on paper. But to write a really good story is not as easy as a lot of people would think. There's there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of time. There's a lot of tears. There's a lot of sweat. There's a lot of fear wondering, you know, did I write this right? Are people going to take this wrong? Did I, did I offend somebody? Um... <clears throat> And to be able to finish writing a book and then get it published is quite an accomplishment. And kudos to you because I'm still not brave enough to publish my writing. <laughs> oh, you need to. Yes. I need to get that backbone. Um, yes. So, you know, uh, my son that, that gave me the books on how to write a novel. Uh, when I was working on the first romance to get it published, I was talking to him and I said, I don't think this is going to be good enough. I don't think that I'm that great of a writer. And he said, Mom, if you didn't have it in you to write a novel, God wouldn't have given you the desire to do it. And that encouraged me. That's a, that's, that's really wise of him, yeah. you know, because I, I, I believe that the ability to, to, to tell stories is, is definitely a gift. And I think we're, we're all given our talents and our purposes. And I, I believe we all have more than one purpose. So maybe one of your purposes is to share your stories. Yes. Well, that sure encouraged me. And I thought, okay, because I thought, you know, he's got a point there. So I plugged on. That was four books ago. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still going, and that's wonderful. Yes. Um, what what cultural value do you see in writing or reading or storytelling? Well, I know this probably sounds like a cliche, but I would say good always wins over evil. That would be the value that I see to put out there because mm -hmm. every book that I have done it's like the good always wins over the evil 
and you know, and that that gives everybody hope. And I I like that writing can be therapeutic. I like that reading can be therapeutic. Um, it helps us see that we're not alone in this world. And sometimes it's just a guilty pleasure to read just something fun and silly. Or um, I just finished reading Radium Girls, and it was very informative about the history of that time and that horrible, horrible experience those girls went through. So, you know, books do serve so many purposes. And I just feel sad that majority of people don't read nearly enough. <laughs> oh, I know it. I, I, I can't, I couldn't stand not being able to read. You know, I just, reading is, I love, I've always been an avid reader, always. I just, and it's almost like if I don't have a book in the bullpen, I get nervous. Like, okay, what if I finish this and I don't have another one right handy to start? <laughs> I think that's one of the reasons why I started doing my tablet reading on my eBooks. Um, I like the feel and the weight and the feel and the smell of a book in my hands. But um, I've learned that I can carry, like, currently I have over 12,000 books in my Kindle library. I can carry my very lightweight tablet and always have something to read versus, oh, God, I just finished the novel. Now what? <laughs> and, I'm getting more and more into, into the Kindle. I am because, like you said, you've got them available. Yes. So, and I like the feel and the looks and the smell of a book. But more and more and more, I'm going to the Kindle. Mm-hmm. I am too, and it's 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 not about tangible versus digital. It, for me, it's just I I'm addicted to the written word, and wherever I can find written words, I want to read them. Yes, I agree. And now, um, how did you choose the first and last lines of your book? Okay, well, the first lines, you know, they say you need to start with a hook. So I did trial and error, trial and error, and trial and error, till I found some first lines that I thought would be a good hook. And then on my last lines, I just chose the words that tied the loose ends together. Okay. That looks good. Now, I do have a question for you that wasn't in my list, but um, you're, when I read your book, it almost played like a movie in my head. Um, I could genuinely see each character, each scene, of course, um, being from, um, uh, living in Springfield for as long as I did for about 17 years before I moved further South to a tiny rural town. Um, I could just, I could picture everything. Like when you talk about I-44 to 65 to sunshine, I'm like, I know that route. <laughs> so if your book was made into a movie. Um, what actors do you think you would like to play your characters if you had that choice? Oh gosh, if I had that choice, uh, I think Lacey would be uh, Sandra Bullock. I, I don't know. You and know, you know she, that's who I thought. Did you really? Okay. Yes. I, I, she's a little bit older. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that that's who I would picture doing doing Lacey. And I don't know who I would want to have to do. Uh, the antagonist, and then Kimberly would be somebody young and, uh, you know, really, I don't know, really feisty. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't place who I want to have her either. I didn't really have anybody in my head other than saying, I could see Lacey as Sandra Bullock, and first, I don't know why, but just just her physicality, her mentality, just uh, that's who she reminded me of. I didn't really get a, a, a feel for other actors either. And the other ones, I was just like, oh, Sandra Bullock would make a great Lacey. <laughs> yes, we need to let her know that. <laughs> yes, she needs to, we need to like prod somebody in Hollywood and say, hey, read this. This would be a great, great movie for somebody. And she'd be awesome in the lead. Yes, you would. <laughs> so, um, what are some books or authors you would recommend to our readers? Oh, gosh, I tell you what, I have, um, <clears throat> I have so many people that I read and that, that I like. Oh, gosh. I, well, my, my number two, the two top ones on my list is Robin Cook and Seth Garrison. 
Uh, yeah. They, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're number one. And I love Lisa Scottolini and Lisa Gardner. Okay. I really like their books. Uh, I like uh, the ones that's in my writer's groups that they that are published. I like uh, Shirley King McCann, Sharon Kaziah Holmes. Tyranny James, Susan King, and Kathleen Gonzi. They they write great. I love reading their books. And you know, like I said, I've got I've got other authors that I really like, and my list could go on and on forever if I tried to name all of them. But Robin Cook and Tess Garretson, uh, of course, you know who they are. Robin Cook is the king uh-huh. of the medical. Yes. Thriller. And actually, Robin Cook is the last time I read a medical thriller. <laughs> Um, I, I do like Robin Cook's writing style as well. And your writing reminded me a little bit of Robin's. Okay. And then Tess Garrison is the female Robin Cook, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. She's, so I, those are my two. Uh, Tess Garrison, she's just she's just amazing. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. Robin Cook, when, uh, years and years ago when I read Coma, oh my gosh, I was sold on his. I've read every book that he has ever written. Oh. Same with Tess Garrison. That's awesome. Um, now, where can where can fans find your books? Uh, my books are on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and uh, the Deliberate Malice is available as an audio book on Amazon and iTunes. Oh, wonderful! Uh, that's my first one that I did the uh, audio book on. So, so what was the audio process like? Did you get to choose who your reader was, or? Oh yeah, uh, one one of the uh, Susan King that's in my uh, writers group, uh, she recommended who uh, who did hers, and so I contacted her, and yes, I got to choose because when you go on, it's oh, it was a, a process to get you had to get an app to get in there, mm-hmm. but different ones walked me through it and helped me, so um, yeah, I got to choose who I wanted to. Oh, do it. that's nice. Yeah. Um, you, you also had the option of letting them pick someone for you, but I, I, I wanted somebody that was recommended to me. That's good. Have you yeah. listened to your audiobook to, to yeah. see how it... Oh, yeah. And when they're in the process of doing it, she gave me the option of doing the whole book and sending it to me and letting me uh, proof it or doing chunks. And I said, send me chunks. So every, I would get like six or eight chapters and then if I okayed them then I told her that that was good if I found something I'd let her know and she would change it Mm -hmm. and yeah we went like that so yeah I've heard it what did you think of it I tell you it was touching because (laughs) I was my last chapters uh when I was listening to her doing the one where uh Lacey is uh very hurt Mm -hmm. over Jake and she's out running and she's out of breath and she's crying I got tears in my eyes I'm like I wrote this and this woman is reading it like if she's really crying you know what I mean she, she did good yes oh that's wonderful yeah I, I like it when the readers can uh, put emotions and and inflections into the what they're reading um, I, I'm, I'm bad I love dramatic readings because they they pull you into the story more for me and another thing place that she brought tears to my eyes is when lacy uh, was talking to the young young girl that had lost her son mm-hmm. and uh when she was doing that part and she actually sounded like she was crying when she was doing it and i'm like here i am getting careful this is my book i created this and it's making me emotional <laughs> Yes, I did find that scene very emotional for me as well, and that was one of the ones where I did have to put it down and 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 just really think on that scene because it was so well written and so empathic, and it almost felt like I couldn't imagine having to what Lacey had 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 she had the courage to go out and talk to this lady, and and kind of put her heart out there on on her sleeve and. I was very impressed. That was one of the things that made your character feel so real to me was that that empathy that came through. She she didn't feel like a doormat. Um, I loved that she's a strong female protagonist. And by strong, I don't mean she's out there, you know, with her gun shooting everybody up and acting like, you know, she can conquer the world all by herself. 
I love that she had inner strength, that she was human, she was able to show her emotions, and that she was able to rely on her friends and colleagues for help through this. But the fact that she, for the most part, she kept her cool, she, she, she solved the problem. Um, I just felt she was a good, strong female lead in the non-toxic feminist way. And I appreciate that because everybody right now is up in arms over toxic masculinity and they forget that there's also toxic femininity out there that just gets on my nerves. <laughs> That's very true. Very true. Very well said. You know, and I just think people are people. And I, I really liked how you wrote everyone. Um, even your villain, I just felt you, you, you showed a bit of respect and some dignity for each character. And I... I was so fascinated, and I, like I said, I was at the edge of my seat trying to figure out who did this, who did this, and I, I almost had to sit on my hands so I didn't jump to the end of the book just to find out who it was, <laughs> because it, it was so well done. Um, well, I do thank you for your time today. Um, I look forward to reading more of your books, and I will put links in the bottom of the the notes so that people can... Uh, link directly to your books on Barnes and Noble and Amazon as well as Audible. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Yes, and again today my guest has been Miss Lois Curran. Um, I thank you all for listening, and until next time, peace and be safe.